Thank you very much for inviting me to do this. And let me confess straight up that I'm not a historian. I'm not a historian of mathematics, and that's why I've put this word sum at the beginning. I've used Latin squares in various experiments, and I've had to delve into the history, but I haven't gone about it like a historian. If I make a mistake, please jump up and down and tell me. <laughs> so, this is just the abstract. I put the abstract up to force myself to stick to what I said I would do. R.A. Fisher, he shares two initials with me, and that's one reason I use my initials, the celebrated statistician who put really experimental design on a sound footing, and one of his recommendations was to use Latin squares in crop experiments. But actually, their use goes further back. And they've led to a whole variety of interesting stuff. So I have to tell you what a Latin square is. This is, I'm a mathematician, I give you a definition. So let n be any positive integer. Then a Latin square of order n, we take an n by n square array, I'll call the things in it cells, and in that we place n symbols in such a way that we get each once in each row and once in each column. Now, They've kindly made just a single page handout which should be on your seats and I did that so that you wouldn't have to remember the definitions because it's so annoying when 10 minutes into a talk you can't remember what the key definitions are. So you'll find the definitions there. And the symbols, they might be A, B, C, D, they might be numbers, they might be colours, blah, blah. So here is a Latin square of order 8. We've got eight different colours. Each colour comes once in each row and once in each column. <coughs> there is another Latin square of order six, and this time we've just got six letters, the obvious ones, A, B, C, D, E, F. And unless I've made a terrible mistake, you should find that in each row you've got all six letters and each column you've got all six letters. Now, I was quite interested that the talk before this showed a stained glass window. Here's a stained glass window from Keyes College, Cambridge. Photographed by my collaborator, John Morgan. And I think you can see in there, there is a Latin square of order seven. And actually, Fisher's name is underneath because he was a fellow of the college for some time. Well, this is in the hall. That's where you eat. On the opposite side of the hall, there's a portrait of R.A. Fisher. This is not so good because I took it, but reflected in it, you can see his window <laughs> from the other side of the hall. And he promoted the use of Latin squares in experiment. In his first book, a little bit, but mostly in his 1935 book called The Design of Experiments. Now, he worked at Rothamsted Experimental Station from 1919 to 1933, and that's where a lot of the stuff that he developed came from. So there's the stained glass window. There is the first edition of his book, which a colleague of mine managed to obtain with its paper cover. Can you see the connection between that and that? Yeah. One is rotated, but essentially it's the same. So Anthony Edwards at Keyes got that picture from the book. But where did the people who published the book get it from? It's not in the book. As far as I know, that square wasn't used in any experiment he ever did. So that's something we might discuss over the reception. There's also, why on earth is it called a Latin square? Now, I do know the answer to that, and we'll come back to that point. So, move on a bit. What are Latin squares used for in experiments? And my experience in agricultural field trials is you often have plots, rectangular plots, in an array with rows and columns on the ground. And the rows and the columns might have different widths. And this is what Fisher wrote in a letter to Jeffries in 1938. He said, on any given field, agricultural operations, at least for centuries, have followed one of two directions, which may usually be taken to be those of rows and columns, and consequently, streaks of fertility, weed infestation, etc., do in fact 
occur predominantly in these two directions. And so, for agricultural experiments in this country, using Latin squares makes sense. I do know that you can't make this assumption for field trials in Australia, because they haven't been using the ground for field trials for anything like as long, and my Australian colleagues have to use different methods. Here is the design of an experiment. This is taken from Fisher's 1935 book, an experiment on potatoes conducted in Ely in 1932. This is the Latin square of order 6 that I showed you before. And although it's written out with A, B, C, D, E, we need this other table to tell us what the letters actually stand for. And there were six manurial treatments. You could have extra nitrogen. Zero means you didn't have any. One means you did have a certain dollop of extra nitrogen in the fertiliser. And that was combined with extra phosphate, either none or one dose or two dose. And he didn't even bother to give us the units. And I normally, as a scientist, would make a fuss saying we have to actually have the units of the data, but they're not given in Fisher's book. This is, it's not agriculture, but it's not so far removed, a forestry experiment on a, in Beth Gallet in Wales. Um, and Fisher designed this. If you look at it, you can believe that that is a 5 by 5 Latin square, laid out in 1929, and it ran for several years. Forestry experiments have to be designed in a long-term way. So, in agriculture, that's the most common. You have rows and you have columns to take a part of the, of the spatial variation. But there are other ways you can have rows and columns, and this one is quite common. But first of all, let me point out that this experiment was reported in 1790. To my knowledge, it's the earliest report of using a Latin square in an experiment. So it was François Cretté de Payel, and this was an experiment on the diet that he gave to sheep. He had four different breeds of sheep, and they labelled the columns. He slaughtered them at four different times. That labels the rows. He had four different things he could feed them on. Potatoes, turnips, beets, or oats and peas. And if you look and see what he's done, the dates are the rows, the breeds are the columns, the different diets go in there, and they form a Latin square. And so that is, as I say, the oldest use I know of a Latin square for an experiment. And that's on the handout, so you don't need to copy it. And just again to show you how rows and columns can come up, some of the stuff that I used to have to do, our experiments would be in plants on pots. So my columns there are the plants, and the sorts of plants you can imagine that have a leaf there and then another leaf a bit higher up and so on. You can have height of leaf and you can have plant as the rows and the columns. So there's all sorts of ways you can have rows and columns and then you need a Latin square to put your treatments in. So, I hope you've got all that. I'm now going to move on to the next topic, which is Greco-Latin squares. If you look here, there's a 3 by 3 Latin square with Latin letters in it, A, B, and C. What have we got there? A 3 by 3 Latin square still, but the letters are Greek. Now, look where letter A comes and move over to the other square. What do we find? Alpha, gamma, beta. Do the same thing with letter B. Move over to the other square. We've got beta, alpha, and gamma. Letter C. And in the other square, again, we've got all three Greek letters. And that has the effect that when you put those two Latin squares on top of each other, so I take that A and that alpha and put them side by side, you get each Latin letter exactly once with each Greek letter. Now, it was a Swiss mathematician, Euler, who invented these, and he called them Greco-Latin squares. And as far as I know, the name Latin square is just a back formation from that. Your Greco-Latin square has the two things in, you pull out one set of letters, and as far as I know, nobody talks about Greek squares, you just talk about Latin squares. So, there is Euler. 
There's another terminology that is also used. If we have two Latin squares of the same order, we say they're orthogonal to each other, precisely when, when you put them on top of each other, you get a Greco-Latin square. And I think that terminology is more common now. And so what I've just showed you, I could otherwise have said, that is a pair of orthogonal Latin squares of order three. Well, then I could go further. Supposing I had three or four squares, every pair of which is orthogonal. Then we call them mutually orthogonal. And here's an example of order four. I've got three squares. So one square is the Latin letters. One square is the Greek letters. One square is the numbers. And if I've got it right, every Latin letter should come once with every Greek letter. Every Latin letter should come once with each number. Every Greek letter should come once with each number. So, I'm a mathematician. I don't give a talk that doesn't have a theorem in it. <laughs> theorem. If we have k Latin squares of order n, and they're mutually orthogonal, then k is no bigger than n minus 1. And my proof is there in red. Here we've got a, alpha, and 1. They're all together. In the next row, they can't be there. They've got to be over there. And they can't ever come together again. And generalizing that essentially gives you the proof. So you can get 3. When can you get n minus 1? We don't know the answer completely, but there is a theorem that says if n is a prime number or a power of a prime number, you can achieve that. And the way it's done uses finite fields. So if you know what finite fields are, you can probably work out how to do it. If you don't, I'm afraid you have to take my word for it. Now, this is one of my standard books I look in. Fisher and Yates, they produced statistical tables for biological, agricultural and medical research in 1938. And it gives a set of mutually orthogonal Latin squares of this maximum size for n is 3, 4, 5, 7, you can't do 6, 8 and 9. And so I've used that. And when I came to use the set of side 9, I stopped and thought, hang on, this isn't what you normally make from the finite field. And as far as I know, nobody knows how Fisher and Yates got that set of mutually orthogonal Latin squares. I mean, if you go on to what people knew 20 years later, it's one of the known ones. But why did they not come up with the obvious one? So I thought I ought to show you how mutually orthogonal Latin squares can be used in experiments. And this I'm taking out of Fisher's book rather than from the original. An industrial experiment. A cotton mill has five spindles. And each spindle has four named components, first, second, third, fourth. And they wanted to know why one spindle kept producing defective weft. And this is the experiment that they did. So the first component I've used the Latin numerals for. The second could be A to E. The third, Greek. The fourth, those numbers. And in the first period... They made one spindle out of components, Roman 1, A, Alpha, Ordinary 1, and so on. And, so what you, and then they made another component out of that, 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 and that, and so on. And then they did something similar. So they kept taking apart these spindles of four bits and putting them together again. In such a way that after five periods, every first component had been together with every third component, and so on. And they produced stuff, and they recorded where the defects occurred. Pretty obvious, eh, which is the defective component? It must be component little Roman 2 of the first component. And I think that was just brilliant, putting those together in those different ways so they could, without doing too much in the way of experimentation, find out where the trouble was, and it all comes down to orthogonal Latin squares. So, now, 
This is something that gets a bit technical, and I hope I can explain it to you. And I'm quoting from a paper that Fisher wrote for the Ministry of Agriculture in 1926. And he begins by lambasting people who use very systematic Latin squares. And this still happens, I'm afraid. Someone says, this Latin square has a very nice pattern, we're always going to use it. The trouble is, if you use a very nice Latin square, if you don't allow for that in the analysis, you may fool yourself. And so he's saying, yeah, I know that in Ireland, in Denmark, they've been using very systematic Latin squares. As I say, I'm not a historian, and he didn't give any references, so I don't know exactly what he's quoting. And he then went on to say, but the term Latin square should not be applied to such systematic arrangements. The problem of the Latin square, from which the name was borrowed, as formulated by Euler, consists in the enumeration of every possible arrangement, subject to the conditions that each row and each column shall contain one plot of each variety. Consequently, the term Latin square should only be applied to a process of randomization by which one is selected at random out of the total number of Latin squares possible. So Fisher was a bit, what's the word, bossy at times. And here is he saying, you lot, you can't call that a Latin square because you didn't choose it at random from all possible ones. So what is the poor experimenter to do? Well, oh, okay. If you're going to do this, you have to know what you can choose from. Well, how many Latin squares are there of order three? Well, I told you I might put letters, I might put colours, I might put numbers. Well, so I could have infinitely many. If we're going to answer this question sensibly, I'm going to have to insist on what the symbols are, and for simplicity, let's just call them one, two, three, up to n. And you say that a Latin square is reduced, so this is another definition. If the symbols in the first row go 1 to n in the obvious way, and the same in the first column. And then we also say that two Latin squares are equivalent if you can get from one to the other by a permutation of the rows, a permutation of the columns, and a permutation of the symbols. And then it's not hard to see that if in an equivalence class you've got m reduced squares, the total number of squares in that class you multiply by n factorial and by n minus 1 factorial. So what about order 3? For a reduced square, you start off like that. Where can the other three go? There's only one place. So that's all you can do. For four, it takes a bit more thinking, so for a reduced square, it's got to be like that. The one on the left I call cyclic, because it's got those diagonals. The one on the right, for those of you who know about group theory, does come from a group, but not from a cyclic group. The one on the right, wherever you look, you've got little two-by-two two subsquares. The one on the left doesn't have so many. This one leads to three reduced squares, that one to one. What about five? Well, again, this is from Fisher's correspondence, and he wrote to McMahon, who was a combinatorialist and had done some counting, and in 1924, this is McMahon writing back to Fisher and saying, well, actually, I've given the mathematical solution. You can find it in my book. For 2, we've got 2. For 3, there's 12. And so on up to 5. Now, he's counting the number completely. So these are big numbers. Gosh, has he got them right. What did Fisher do? Fisher got out his pencil, and next to those numbers, he divided by n factorial, n minus 1 factorial, to get the numbers of reduced squares. So this is what I just showed you. 1 for 3, 4 for 4. And that made 52 for 5. That's a picture of Fisher at the time. 
They continued writing back and forth, and by September of that year, they decided that number shouldn't be 52, it should be 56. But actually, Euler knew that and had published it in 1782. Cayley knew it. He'd published it the previous century. So, you know, in the background of Latin squares, information wasn't getting around to the people who needed it. So, what is it with order five? There's two equivalence classes. That one is cyclic. It's got all those diagonals. This one doesn't come from a group at all. This one has got a two-by-two two subsquare. That one doesn't have any. They give 6 and 50 reduced squares. So what's your experimenter going to do? He needs to pick a square at random. Well, in that 1926 paper, Fisher said, the statistical laboratory at Rothamsted is prepared to supply these. He thought it was part of his job. And then, because he thought he needed to know, Frank Yates joined him at Rothamsted in the early 30s and they did the work and they published a paper counting the Latin squares of order 6. And as I say, they produced these statistical tables. Their statistical tables, I'm, I'll confess a, a hole here, include reduced Latin squares of order 2, 3 and 4, I think they went as far as five, but of course when I was making these slides, I found I had mislaid my copy of this, but so I think they did actually put out all 56. But when you get up to six, six, no way can you do all the reduced squares. They just gave one from each equivalence class. So what numbers have we got? There's reduced, there's equivalence classes. That's up to five, which is as far as we've gone. Then they did that paper with the six by six squares. But again, Tarry had done all that work in 1900, and actually so had Froloff earlier. <laughs> it took a while before Norton thought he had done the seven by sevens, and Saad, he just missed out one class, which Saad corrected the next year. Now, as the squares get bigger, the work gets very hard. There's a lot of enumeration to do. And until you've really got computers on the job, you're stuck. We didn't get the 8x8s eight until 1967. So I was teaching some of this stuff before the 9x9s nine had been counted. And these were I put bigger than. The numbers are known exactly. They're just too big to fit on my slide. You know, you can find them out. And... I think this is the most recent. Brenda McKay and Ian Wanless are absolutely geniuses when it comes to doing computer searches in an efficient way. You don't just go about it in the obvious way. You cut things down so you don't recount things. And that's where we are. And where I've said that this was incomplete, whereas that was wrong, I'm quoting from what they said about it. But now let's go back. Fisher said, it's not a Latin square unless you choose at random from all of them. That's what he said in 1926. There's been lots of arguments about Fisher, and I'm afraid one of the problems is that actually he lays down the law in a very bossy way, and then you find he's contradicted himself somewhere else. So which do you believe? And in his 1925 book, so that was earlier, and in his 1935 book later, and also in many papers by Frank Yates, they didn't say you need to choose at random from all Latin squares. They said, so long as we eliminate bias in the estimate of the difference between two treatments, and so long as we eliminate bias in the estimate of the variance of that, that's fine. And that's assuming that when we analyse the data, we allow for rows and columns. So... I won't spend too long on this, but so we call that valid if we get those two conditions, and all you have to do is first of all make sure that every cell in the square is equally likely to get any of the letters. That gets rid of the first sort of bias. And for the second sort, you have to think about pairs, and if you have an ordered pair of cells which are in different rows and columns, 
they're slightly more likely to get the same letter than different letters. And given that, it has to be the same. And, and if you work out, the probabilities have to be something for the same and something else for difference. That's what they have to be. And that makes it valid. So in particular, if you just start with a single Latin square, randomly permute the rows, randomly permute the columns, that will do the job. And that is now what everybody recommends and what Fisher recommended, in spite of his previous going on about it. <coughs> well, if you're up to that, and you know about the group theory, you can see that you don't have to use the whole symmetric group, any old doubly transitive group will do instead. And, in fact, if you have a complete set of mutually orthogonal Latin squares and choose one of those at random and then just randomise the letters, that will also satisfy it. And Fisher said that himself in the middle of a huge argument discussing Neyman's paper. So Fisher was not the most consistent of people. So finally, on the topic of randomization. In 1956, a German statistician called Behrens introduced what he called Gerechte designs, fair designs. They're like Latin squares, but a bit more fair. You can see here he's divided up the field into these little rectangles of size 6, and he's made sure that every letter comes once in each of them. What does that remind you of? Yep. Yeah. I mean, in some of the papers, they do actually give a Sudoku of this size. So this is, predates that. So if you're going to allow for those little rectangles, when you design the experiment, you ought to allow for it in the data analysis as well. And now how can we randomise this to make sure we don't mess up those little rectangles? Well, there are three pairs of rows. We've got to permute those pairs. Within each pair, randomise the rows. There are two triples of columns. Randomly swap them or not. Within each triple, you've got three columns. Permute them at random. But then when you do that, as well as fixing the small rectangles, you're fixing small rows of three. You're fixing small columns of two. And your data analysis had better allow for that. But hang on. We didn't say anything about what pattern of letters should come in those small rows and small columns. So when you think about the randomization, it gets you to thinking about more about what's going on. And if you're designing an experiment where you haven't got room to put all the letters in something, what do you do? Well, you do something called an incomplete block design. So if I've got an experiment and I'm thinking about my experimental units, if they aren't all alike, I'll say if I've got a homogeneous group of them, I'll call them a block. Now, in an agricultural experiment, a block is typically a line of ploughing. In an industrial experiment, as we saw in that cotton one, it's usually a time period. And if the size of the block isn't big enough for you to put all treatments in it, then we call it an incomplete block. And so we say it's an incomplete block design. How on earth should we make an incomplete block design? Well, Frank Yates did something about this in the 1930s. And rather than tell you the general, I'll tell you what he did for nine treatments, and you can guess how it generalises. So we've got nine treatments, and he simply writes them down in a square. He writes down this Latin square and this Greek square that we've seen before. Now, we have blocks of size three, and we start off, we could do a design with six blocks. One block has one, two, three, that row then these blocks correspond to those rows. One, four, seven, that's that column. So the first three blocks are rows, the next three are columns, and if that's all we've got room for, we can stop there. Supposing we've got room for three more blocks. What does he do? He says, OK, let's look at the Latin square. A, 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 move over there, that's one, five, nine. We make a block with one, five, nine. B, 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 two, six, seven. And then the same for C. So if we want a design with nine blocks, we can do that. Well, you can probably guess what to do if we have three more blocks. 
We go on to the Greek square. Alpha, alpha, alpha. One, six, eight. That gives us that block. Beta gives us that. And gamma gives us that. And if we can actually go as far as those 12 blocks, we get a design which is something which is called balanced. And that means that every pair of treatments come together in the same number of blocks. I can guarantee you now, if you do it quickly, choose your two favourite numbers between 1 and 9. Look and see how many blocks they both come in. The answer is 1, no matter which two you choose. Well, then Yates went a bit further. So this is the design I just showed you, with 12 blocks of size 3. And he said, aha, I can add some more treatments. Let's make the blocks of size 4. Put treatment 10 there. Then treatment 10 has come with everything once. Put treatment 11 there. That comes with everything once. Put 12 there. Put 13 there. Oh, but 10, 11, 12 and 13 haven't come with each other. Bingo. Put them on the end. And there we've got a block design with 13 blocks of size 4. And it's also balanced that any two come together just once. Now, much later it was shown that balanced designs are optimal in a rather, in a sense I can make precise in terms of minimising the variance. That's what you want to do. And in fact, even the smaller ones, all of these lattice designs are optimal. But actually, Yates was doing this in the 1930s, and optimality wasn't defined until the 50s. So he was doing quite well. The other thing is, some of you might recognise that this design is a projective plane, and the one right at the end of the previous slide was an affine plane. Yates had never heard the first thing about affine geometry or projective geometry back in 1936. So this really is quite amazing. So let me move on to another use of Latin squares. This is the Latin square I showed you early on of size 6. And I've showed you how sometimes we do things at different time points. And quite early in my career, I was involved in something where different tasters had to taste different cheeses and rate them. So you have to imagine here we've got six people tasting six sorts of cheese. And you see it's all very fair. Every cheese gets tasted in each period. And everybody tastes each cheese. Now, supposing cheese E leaves a nasty aftertaste. Hmm, what comes after cheese E? Mostly it's cheese B. Now, the maker of cheese B might come along and shout, foul! You know, these people have still got a nasty taste in their mouth. That wasn't a fair experiment. So what do we do about that? Well, we're mathematicians, so we define something. <laughs> and we define a Latin square to be column complete if it's fair for cheese tasting. <laughs> OK? In every you know, each treatment is followed in the same column by each other treatment exactly once. The first paper I know about this was by someone called Williams, and he didn't call them column complete. That was invented later. And he gave such squares. I've only shown it here. If treatment one is the one that tastes bad, you see it's followed by five, two, four, zero, and three. And if you want to check for any of the others, it's also fair. And he gave a method of construction that works for all even orders. You can't actually do it for small, odd numbers. <coughs> and these are still very widely used in tasting experiments, like the cheese one. Also in trials of new drugs. <coughs> obviously, these are drugs just to alleviate symptoms, because obviously, you know, if treatment one cures you, there's no point going on to the other things, but to alleviate symptoms of chronic conditions. And the people in those areas, they call them William squares. They've never heard the term column complete. Whereas combinatorialists will talk about column complete and might not know what you mean by a William square. Well, I think about things on the ground. And 
I told you what column complete means. You can guess what row complete means. It's the same thing in rows. And if you're worried about what's happening on the ground, you might want a, what's called a complete Latin square. It has that property in both directions. And I'm very proud of this. In my 10 years at Rothenstedt Experimental Station, one of my experiments got photographed, and that is a complete Latin square. But now, hang on, on the ground. Now, with cheese tasting, you're thinking, what comes after that one? On the ground, if I'm a tall sunflower, you have to remember, gosh, there's, there's the south, right. I might be shading that guy. But if I've simply got something nasty here, it might spread that way just as much as that way. And the other ways too, but rows and columns are often different sizes. But for some experiments, what happens on the east of you and what happens on the west, you might count equally badly. And so there's this more general definition. A Latin square is quasi-complete if each treatment has each other treatment as a neighbour in rows exactly twice. You don't care whether it's east or west. And similarly in columns. There's an example, and I've highlighted just the numbers 1 and 4, but it should work for any two. They're next to each other twice in rows, and they're next to each other twice in columns. Now, Jeff Freeman defined these. He worked in agricultural statistics for his entire career. A couple of years later, he did a computer enumeration for small orders. And a few years after that, I've never been a computer enumeration person. I tend to try and find a nice way that I can construct them for all orders. And that's what I did. But then we found there was something of a paradox when you think about how you randomise these. So if you go back to what Fisher said originally, you must choose at random from the largest possible number of squares that satisfies your property. And later he came down to this idea of so long as it's valid, that's OK. So supposing we can find a set of quasi-complete Latin squares of a given size. We put just the first row in natural order and then randomise the treatments. For the size 7, there is a set of 864 such squares, which has the property that that's a valid randomisation. And it's rather important that that number is divisible by 6. Because once you've got the first row, what comes in the top corner should be able to come anywhere in the six places in the next row that aren't in the same column. But if you look at the work Jeff Freeman did, my 864 leave out 32. So if you look at all quasi-complete Latin squares of this size, you get 896. That number is not divisible by 6. <laughs> Choosing at random from that larger set is not valid. And that seems to be very odd. I'll just leave it there, I think. Because I want to come back to a rather nice story. So I told you, Euler really got Greco-Latin squares going, orthogonal Latin squares. So, for what values of n can we find a pair of orthogonal Latin squares? And he proved this theorem. We can do it if n is odd. We can do it if n is divisible by 4. I'm going to show you the proof. A sketch of the proof. It's in three steps. If n is odd... In row i and column j, in one square you put i plus j, in the other you put i plus 2j, you work modulo n. It's not hard to show that those are mutually orthogonal. 4 and 8, you do it with your bare hands. You can do it from a finite field or you can just do it by trial and error. You can do it. And now there's a very believable theorem that says if I've got 
orthogonal squares L1 and L2 of order n, and I've got orthogonal squares M1 and M2 of order little m. Now, if I've got a square of order n and one of order m, there's a very natural product construction, which I write like that, which gives you a square of order nm. And if the n ingredients are orthogonal and the m ingredients are orthogonal, then so is their product. You can do all odd numbers, you can do four, you can do eight. By taking suitable products, you prove that theorem. So Euler said, OK, I conjecture that you can't do the other numbers. The other numbers are the even numbers, not divisible by four. What was his evidence? Well, it's true for two, because you can't make a pair of orthogonal squares for two. He couldn't do it for six. Someone called Tarry in 1900 managed to prove that. And he did it by brute force enumeration. I don't know if you remember when I was showing you that table of enumeration earlier, Tarry showed up in there because he had done this. And so everybody believed this. Until 1959. R.C. Bose began his working life as an agricultural statistician in India. And after doing a lot of really good work, he eventually moved to the statistics department in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And Shrikanda was a student of his. And in 1959, they published a paper that is a pair of orthogonal Latin squares of order 22. As far as I know, completely independently, the same year, a mathematician called Parker published a paper saying, well, I won't go into all the blah, blah, but we can do orthogonal squares with various values which include 10, 34, 46, 70. Suddenly it looked as if Euler, the great Euler, was wrong. So those three got together, and next year they did it. They proved that Euler was as wrong as he could have been. Apart from two and six, you can always do it. And would you believe it? This got reported in the New York Times. Can you imagine that happening today? A mathematical theorem coming out in the main newspapers. I never met Bose. I did meet Srikanda. He was a student at the time. I met him about ten years ago at a conference. He's an incredibly pleasant and modest man. And hearing him talk about this... He said, wow, that must have been the most exciting time in my life, proving that Euler's conjecture was wrong, so wrong, and getting it in the newspapers. So that's it from me today.